cases. So good, good morning, everybody. Good evening in some places or good afternoon. It's a pleasure to have our CAT conference again. Thank you for joining. And today I'm really honored to have Margaret McEntigar join us and talk to us about an approach to calcified lesions. Um, Margaret, I'm a bit of a fan of yours. I don't know if you know that, but um, when I saw you do live cases for TCT last year, that's when I became a fan. Um, <laughs> you really are superb and a superb operator. It's a real, it's a real pleasure to have you join us. And today we also have Aisha Kare, who, who's been a big supporter of our Monty Heart conferences, and who's going to moderate this with you. So it's all yours, Margaret. Okay, thanks, Azim, and thanks for inviting me to to speak to um, this morning, this afternoon here in Scotland. So what I thought I'd do is I'm going to speak to you about um, how I approach uh, calcified disease and calcified lesions. Because um, over the last couple of years, there's been a kind of, ex kind of significant expansion, I suppose, in the tools that we have available to manage calcium. And that got us thinking that we should maybe try and work on some kind of systematic approach to assess calcium and also then choose what device we should use in each specific case. So we kind of had a big brainstorm and we came up with this kind of mind map algorithm that we use with a degree of fluidity, but just to give us some kind of guidance and also just really to engage our mind when we're approaching these lesions to try and use logic and systems to manage um, the lesion as best we can to get the best uh, outcome for the patient. So what I'll do is I'm going to take you through this step by step and show you um, two or three cases just to illustrate um, how we use it everyday practice in, in the lab here. So like with everything, you're going to start with your angiographic assessment. And if we go back 25 years, uh, Gary Mintz uh, defined coronary calcium on angiography, as you see here. So male calcium is isolated spots of radioopacity on the angiography. Once you start to see multiple radioopacities during cardiac motion, that becomes moderate calcium. And once you start to see radioplasties on both sides of the vessel, when the, the heart is still on a fluoroscopy, then that's defined as a severe calcium. Now that's quite a nice, simple way uh, to think about it, but the problem is it's not very sensitive. So this is a really lovely study done three years ago where what they did was they took 440 patients who'd had CT and were found to have coronary calcium on CT. The patients then all had angiography OCT and IVUS, and what they did was look to see how good each modality was at picking up the calcium that was seen on the CT. And what they found that was in angiography alone, you only actually see 44 calcium in 44% of the patients actually had visible calcium in the corneas on the CT. That goes up to 77% with OCT and the best uh, IVUS at 83%. So that's a little bit concerning, but somewhat reassuringly, if you find no calcium in the angiogram or mild calcium, so the isolated spots. If you then go on and do OCT, actually the calcium angle or the arc of calcium is, is, is small, less than 90 degrees. The calcium is not particularly thick and the length of the calcified segment is short, a mean of four millimeters. So despite the fact you're only picking up less than half of the calcium that's seen on the CT, actually, if you can't see it, it's probably not going to be problematic and you can just go ahead confidently and do your PCI without worrying too much about it. But if you start to see multiple radioopacities or calcium both sides of the vessel or calcium when the, the, the heart is still in fluoroscopy, then really we should be thinking to assess that calcium in much more detail using intravascular imaging. We'll come back to that in a wee while. So when we think about how we're going to manage the calcium, the first thing I think about is where is the lesion and what's the morphology of it? And I think about it along these lines here. Am I dealing with left main disease? Is it an osteo right? Is it a large lumen, so a vessel that's maybe five millimetres that has a lot of disease but still has a large lumen? Or is it a tight lumen, so there's a critical lesion that might not be crossable? Is it in tortuous segment of the vessel? And how long is the area of calcium that I'm going to have to treat? So if we start with critical lesions, so if you've got a lesion that's uncrossable and critical, then you're probably just going to go straight to rotational atherectomy or in some institutions where it's available, laser. I'll come back to this later on, but also you're likely to probably want to use atherectomy if you have a very long segment of calcific disease. And that's because the other technologies, the balloon-based technologies, you're going to have to use multiple times over a long segment 
or with some devices like the new shockwave IVL, you'd need multiple devices to treat a long segment. So with long lesions, I tend to also uh, reach for a rotational atherectomy. We don't as yet in Europe have or orbital, so rotational would be our first choice. If we look at the other group of lesions, if we look at the left main bifurcation, osteo-rights, large lumens and tortuosity, in this situation, I'm likely to look towards using a balloon-based technology if, if possible. Now, I'm just going to expand on that and, and explain to you what my, my, my thought process is here. So if we start with left main bifurcation, and it, can I excuse my hand-drawn uh, images? I haven't had these animated yet properly. If we look at a left main bifurcation like you see here, and you've got Medina 111 disease involving both the osteum of the LED, osteum of the circ, and the distal uh, segment of the left main, and you've decided you need to modify calcium in both limbs of that bifurcation. If I'm going to perform rotational atherectomy in this situation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotablate the more severe limb first, the limb that I'm most worried about losing access to. So I'm going to Take a wire in to say the circumflex, use a mica catheter and exchange that for the rotowire, and then I'm going to rotablate from the left main into the circumflex. But undoubtedly, by doing that, I'm going to modify that plaque and probably create some subintimal planes in that plaque. And then what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to wire left main into LED across that disrupted plaque. I'm going to have to switch the rotor system now from the left main into the LED and complete the, the second limb of the atherectomy. After I've done that, cause, having caused more disruption, I'm going to then have to rewire the circumflex. So we've had to rewire now twice through disrupted plaque in the distal left main. Now we do this regularly on a weekly, almost daily basis, but there is obviously some hazard involved with that. So sequential atherectomy knows effective treatment for calcified distal left main bifurcation disease, but there is some risk involved and it's quite inefficient. It's quite time consuming to switch kit back and forward from the different limbs before you even get to, to, to dealing with your bifurcation stenting technique. So alternatively, if you were able to maintain wires in both limbs, so you get a wire in your circumflex, wire in your LED, and even if you had a trifurcation, a third limb, you've got an effective balloon-based technology. You, you use that on the first limb, the second limb, and then you can go on and do your two cent bifurcation. So a much more efficient way to do it with lower risk, avoiding the need to rewire repeatedly through disruptive plaque. But obviously the reason that we've done double 